Therefore, the testes generate millions, or even 300 million of sperm cells every day. This means that if a man has two functional tests, he may have produced anywhere between 50 and 70,000 sperm cells since the beginning of the video. Where do all these sperm cells go? How can one maintain such an efficient production? Is there a problem if sperm cells aren't released? And one of the more intriguing questions is, could more frequent release of sperm or other reproductive substances lead to any potential health benefits, such as a reduction in cancer risk? These are obviously very important questions that almost every man has probably wondered about. So let's tackle them in the name of science. But before we continue with this interesting video, I would like to ask you to like the video and subscribe to our channel for more information about your health. Sperm cells are produced in tiny tubes in each tesis called seminiferous tubules. Here's a right tesis or a testicle, and if you open it up, you can see these string-like seminiferous tubules, and again, if you average out 300 million per day, that is nearly 3,500 sperm cells being produced per second. But can we also mention another really cool random fact about the tests? Have you ever heard of the blood-brain barrier? This is a barrier that only allows certain substances to pass from the blood and into the brain, essentially creating this protective filter for the delicate nervous tissue. So what does this have to do with the tests? Well, there's also a blood test barrier. Now this isn't actually a barrier of blood for the whole test, but just a barrier between the blood and the developing sperm cells. The main reason for this is to isolate the sperm cells from the immune system because the sperm cells are actually recognized as foreign to our immune cells, so we want to prevent these developing sperm cells from being gobbled up. Now, once the sperm stored in a 20-foot long tube are created by these seminiferous tubules, which eventually move them into a structure on the backside of each tesis called the epidemis. Inside the epidemis is a coil tube called the ductus epidemis, which, if it were straightened out, could be up to 6M, or roughly 20 feet long. This is where sperm are stored and mature before being released from the body, and it provides an answer to the question, where do they all go? Because a 20-foot tube can hold a significant amount of microscopic sperm cells. However, there are still potential limitations as theoretically, if ejaculation were to never occur, or if there wasn't a way to deal with sperm that wasn't released at that point, could eventually fill up with sperm cells. What happens if sperm are not released? Would love to tell you some epic story that when there are too many sperm cells, they go to war with one another, and it's the X sperm cells versus the Y sperm cells strangling each other with their tails and eventually cutting the epidermal sperm population in half. But it's a lot more simple than that. As sperm stay longer and longer in the epidemis, they start to break down or degenerate and get reabsorbed by other cells lining the epidemis. So, as new sperm cells are being produced each day, older sperm cells are also being reabsorbed. Now, this also explains what happens after the male birth control procedure called the vasectomy. A tube that is located after the epidermis known as the vas defense is cut so that sperm cells cannot exit. But during male climax secretions from the prostate seminal glands and bubble urethral glands are still released. Into the naked eye would pretty much look identical but under the microscope, you would see that it contains no sperm cells, so again, because sperm cells can be broken down and reabsorbed in the epidemis. If they are not released, it shouldn't be much of a problem, but could there be other potential benefits to consistent or frequent ejaculation, like a potential reduction in prostate cancer risk? Now, I can just see all the males out there getting ready to approach their significant other and say as romantically as possible, hey, it's cancer risk reduction time. But before we see if there's any truth to cancer risk reduction, in particular, is there a chance that the danger of prostate cancer, which affects around one in eight men in their lifetime, could be decreased? If so, is there a possible relationship between the risk of prostate cancer and the frequency of ejaculation? As I mentioned earlier, the prostate secretions are part of the ejaculate and help to nourish and protect the sperm cells. However, there is a theory that if there is an accumulation or buildup of prostatic secretions, some of this excess may become carcinogenic, increasing the risk of prostate cancer development. This theory is sometimes referred to as the prostate stagnation hypothesis. To be clear, there are other factors besides frequency of ejaculation that contribute to the development of prostate cancer. 
Is it important? How many ejaculations there are? The first and most renowned study in this field looked at the average monthly number of ejaculations for about 30,000 men between the ages of 46 and 81. They looked at the average number of ejaculations during their young adult years, such as ages 20 to 29, when they are in middle age, ages 40 to 49, and even in their more recent years. What they found was that a high frequency of ejaculation correlated with about a 20% risk reduction in prostate cancer when compared to the lower frequency of ejaculation. Of course, everyone is probably wondering what high frequency versus low frequency, what does this mean? Well, the high frequency was 21 or more times per month, which indicates that these were quite an active group of people, and the low frequency was four to seven times per month. Similar findings were found in another study conducted in Australia, though the sample size was much smaller, just over 2,300 men, and the men who averaged 4.6 to 7 times per week were also less likely to receive a prostate cancer diagnosis before the age of 70 than those who only averaged 2.3 times per week. This effect seemed to be strongest if the high frequency occurred more in early adulthood. Finally, I would like to make it clear that these studies counted all ejaculations, whether they were intercourse self or nocturnal emissions. Let's face it, nobody really gets 21 nocturnal emissions, or what we used to call freebies, every month. They just don't get 21 of these. Nevertheless, they included any freebie or nocturnal emission in the totals, so what should we do? What does prostate cancer mean by this? Do with all the information we've discussed in this video so far. Well, first, we know we don't have to worry about a buildup of sperm cells because the body will just reabsorb those on its own. But more importantly, what should we do with this information about prostate cancer risk? Does this mean that everyone should just strive for 21 times a month or five times per week? Well, there are a couple of things to consider. One, this was a risk reduction for low-risk prostate cancer. This didn't include higher risk or more aggressive metastasizing prostate cancers. And although the studies, especially the first study, were well done and tried to account count from multiple variables, you have to consider potential errors in self-reporting from the men recounting their ejaculation frequency. And even there still just aren't a lot of research studies in this area. So I do think it is hard to say that just everyone absolutely needs to strive for this magic number of 21. I think we still need more studies and data repeating these results before we can give a definitive answer like that but it definitely doesn't seem like it can hurt. So if you already at 21 or more, good for you. If if you want to strive for more to get closer to that 21, good luck in your journey. And let's be honest, there can be many other benefits if some of those 21 come with the help of that special someone that you just love and adore with all of your anatomy. So hopefully you got some fun information and useful information from today's video. We appreciate your support of our channel. If you would want to keep doing so, please click on, and if you haven't already, please subscribe. Of course, we'll see you in the next video.